We're studying the life of David from the book of First Samuel. We are in chapter 22. If you'd open your Bible there, First Samuel 22, verses 1 through 5 is our text. The topic we'll find there is this. When David flees to the cave at Adullam, other outcasts begin to join him there and he becomes their champion. The title of our message is Cave Heart. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. It's open before us now and we want our hearts, Lord, to receive it. The way that's intended to be received, Lord, knowing that you love us and care for us knowing that your grace is abounding in our lives, encouraging us, Lord, to share with others, not out of obligation, but out of that same love, so that they might know what we know, that Jesus Christ is alive and risen from the dead. Five verses, Lord, but they're just packed with wonderful insight into your mercies, which are new and tender every morning. I pray that we would glean everything that we can from them, Lord, and that you would speak to each of us individually. We pray these things in Jesus' name and everyone who agrees said, Amen. Archaeologists in Rehab, Jordan in 2008 discovered a cave that they called the world's oldest Christian church. Dating to the period of between 33 and 70 AD, the underground chapel would have served as both a place of worship and a residence. Dr. Abdul Qadir Al-Hassan, the director of the Center for Archaeological Studies there, described a circular worship area with stone seats separated from a living area that had a long tunnel leading to a source of water. The indications are that the early Christians hid there from persecution. Long before Christians worshipped in that Jordanian cave, a persecuted David escaped to the cave of Adullam. If you read Psalm 57 and Psalm 142, both of which were penned by him at this period in his life, you'll see that it was indeed a place of worship. When others heard David was there, they joined him. They emerged from the cave and began affecting their world as they waited for the rightful king to be crowned. We don't meet in a cave I think, however, that a case can be made that our church and every other Bible teaching church should be a cave-like retreat. I'll try to make that case from verses 1 through 5 of 1 Samuel 22. I'll organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, your church is the cave you escape to in order to be affected by the king. And number two, your church is the cave you emerge from in order to affect the kingdom. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, your church is the cave you escape to in order to be affected by the king. David was fleeing for his life from King Saul. He tried to hide in the city of Nob among the priests at the tabernacle of the Lord, but he was discovered by a spy of Saul's who happened to be there. Then he fled to the Philistine territory and was there in Gath trying to blend in, but he immediately was recognized and narrowly escaped. David next fled to a cave. And we pick the story up in verse 1. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now I came across the following description of this cave. One large broken rock weighing many uh, tons, excuse me, almost bars the entrance. Nearby is a spring of clear, cool running water. The only access to the cave is through a circular opening some seven feet high. Inside, there is a narrow low passage leading to a small cave from which a winding passage leads to a large room of about 5,000 square feet. Narrow passages branch out and lead to other large rooms, some of which are on lower levels. There is ample room within to house a 1,000 men. Now, if my geography is correct, this cave of Adullam is between Judah of the Israelites and Gath of the Philistines. It is thus between, we would say, two kingdoms. You and I, as Christians, we live between two kingdoms. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. But that kingdom has yet to be fully realized on the earth. There is a spiritual reality to the kingdom as we serve the Lord. But there is a real literal kingdom coming when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation and establishes his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. And so we are living in really kind of a tension 
living according to the rules of that kingdom uh, in our heart, but it hasn't been established yet. Instead, we are living in the kingdom of darkness, really. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world, that he is the ruler of this world. And so every day we are out shining as lights in the kingdom of darkness. As a result, it can be extremely stressful, extremely difficult as we try to live between these two worlds because they are constantly colliding with one another. We need a place, a cave, if you will, to retreat to in order to rest and worship. And your church ought to be a place like that where you can come and find safety and encouragement and the blessing of the Lord where you can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Now, something very interesting and very exciting happened to David at the cave. Others began to gather to him there. Verse 1 again, David departed from there. He escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. And there were about 400 men with him. Why gather to David? Well, on a practical level, people were realizing that he was the Lord's choice to be king. His family knew that because they had been there some years earlier when David was anointed to be the next king by the prophet Samuel. The citizens of Israel seemed to know it because they followed the exploits of David and they saw that he was a better king than Saul. And now even the enemies of Israel knew it. When David was in Gath trying to hide, they looked at him and said, isn't this David the king of the land? Not they knew who the king was. They knew it was Saul, but they understood that David was in line to take over. And so there were some practical reasons why why people would gather there. But still, I think this has spiritual significance. This is something like a revival. David had been anointed. His family knew that, perhaps some others by this time. The nation of Israel knew it. Even the enemies really knew it. But nobody really did anything uh, about it. No one gathered to David until he was down at this cave. And then suddenly, without sending out any messengers, without any warning really, people begin to gather uh, to David. And it reminds me of a revival. Essentially, a revival... Imagine what would happen, you know, one Sunday if we came here to church and other Bible teaching churches in town and literally hundreds or thousands of people decided to gather on that day. The same people who kind of know that there is a a God, that Jesus is his son, even Christians who are backslidden and are just not living for the Lord. And then supernaturally, suddenly there is this gathering, there is this calling, there is this pull. It's nothing short of a revival and we... Continue to pray for that. uh, Scholars and theologians, they they can't decide if prayer brings revival or revival brings prayer because they seem to coincide. All I can say is that we should pray. And when there is a burden to pray and when people gather for prayer, when they have to pray, then we see the Lord move in a community. Now, the people obviously gathering to David is a type of our gathering to Jesus Christ. Jesus, of course, is God's choice to be king. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the meantime, the Lord's family gathers to him. As Christians, we are born again. We are born into the family of God, children of God. Adopted also into the family of God, we learn in Scripture. From the moment you are saved, you feel drawn to meet with other believers. If you were saved later in life, came to faith in Jesus Christ, one of the things that you immediately didn't have to be told to do, but just sensed, is that you wanted to be around other Christians. You, you, uh, it was sort of like the day of uh, Pentecost when Peter and the, and the boys, you know, received the Holy Spirit and then Peter preached and then people got saved and they just hung around in Jerusalem. He said, well, we're not going to go home now. 
We, we need to learn more about this Jesus. And you guys were with him, and so let's just all hang out together. And, and that, there was just kind of a natural desire for you to meet with other Christians. Over time, as you meet as the family of God, you notice that others who were like you in the past start to meet. They're in distress. They're in debt. They're discontented. That's as good a description of a non-believer as you are likely to find. Regardless what you see on the surface in the life of a non-believer, they either are or will be and just don't know it in distress, in debt, and discontented. What does it mean to be distressed? Well, it's difficult to live under the reign of the devil. At some point, there comes an awareness that things are not right, that there is something very wrong about life. And living it. There are perplexities, both global and personal, that distress a person, causing them to ask ultimate questions and to seek for ultimate answers. It may take a long time for people to admit that. They may hide that distress. They may try to fill their lives with other activities and other pursuits, but there is a nagging suspicion somewhere in the back of their minds that there is more to life and they haven't discovered what it is. They might enjoy a hobby or a habit or a relationship, but there's just something that is distressing them. They see the trouble and the tragedy all around them and they want to know what the answer is. The answer is for them to retreat to the rightful king, to discover him perhaps in his cave among his family. What does it mean to be in debt? In our context, it refers to the debt of sin that we each owe as human beings. It's a debt we can never hope to pay. Describing it, Alan Redpath said, and I quote, So long as you remain in the devil's camp with the rejected ruler, there are ten commandments which thunder at you and you find yourself condemned by God's law. The debt of sin that you can't pay. Jesus came. He died on the cross. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. What does it mean to be discontented? The word, uh, the word, excuse me, means to be embittered or frustrated or disappointed. Under the rule of Satan, this is the best that you can hope for. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes and he says that God has put eternity in our hearts. Lately, even some in the scientific community are uh, referring to this as being hardwired for spirituality. That's the term that they've used. They're beginning to notice in their study of the human being, the human heart, the human mind, that people have a, a, a connection to spirituality that they're trying to make. And Solomon knew that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says there is eternity in your heart. Now, if you're trying to fill a void in your heart that is made for eternity... What are you going to find in this world that is going to fill that? It's like those toys that you play with, you know, the, to, to teach kids the, their shapes, triangle, square, and they don't always fit, and it's frustrating. You have to get the right block and the right, uh, you know, uh, shape and all that. And so people go through their whole life searching for that which will fit the eternity that's in their hearts. You see this with famous people and celebrities all the time. You, you watch them on these TV shows and they seem so happy and, 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 and satisfied. And they say, oh yeah, I've never been more happy than I am in my whole life. A week later, two weeks later, they're divorced. They're, they're committing suicide. They're in jail. They are doing something because they're liars. They, they lie. They think they're happy. They Right at then, at that moment, they think, I am filling my life with this, but there's a nagging suspicion that there's something more, and that something more is eternity, and that can only be filled in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so this cave, this wonderful cave that we come to, you know, it, it, where Christians gather, and then the non-believer sees that, and they want to come, and they say, look, what is the answer that you have? I... I I can't fill this void in my life. Now, in keeping with this thought that the church is cave-like or to be cave-like, two things come to my mind. First, if we're not feeling the pull to gather together, 
maybe we're getting a little too comfortable out in the devil's kingdom. If there is no stress, no pressure, no persecution of any kind going on in my life, then I might not be being identified with the exiled king. Uh, there, There needs to be some measure of struggle. If I'm out in, if I'm a Christian living for the kingdom of God and I'm out in the kingdom of Satan, that's not going to fly. There's going to be a problem sooner or later. And if there's not, don't look for a problem. It's coming. All right. But at least search your heart and say, now, how much like the world am I? Am I too much like the world? Can the devil just leave me alone because I'm not really making a difference? And the second thing, and perhaps more pertinent to us, We need to really understand that non-believers are going to be very difficult people to be around. Like you were when you were a non-believer. Some of you were really belligerent to your Christian friends. You, You hated your Christian friends. You didn't want to be around them. You ignored them. You said terrible things about them. I Maybe it's just me. I'm sorry. I'm projecting onto you. The guy who ended up leading me to faith in Jesus Christ, or at least praying the sinner's prayer with me, Some months before Pam and I got saved, he and his wife had gotten saved and we worked together and I said so many terrible things about him. I made so much fun of him to his face, behind his back. His, you know, he came to Christ, his entire life changed. He wouldn't drink with me anymore. His wife changed all of her behaviors, how she dressed, how she approached life. We couldn't make enough fun of them. It was terrible, really, and they just kept loving us through it. And so I know what it's like. And, and we need to remember, you, that's, what, that's what you can expect from a non-believer. The Bible says that a non-believer is uh, taken by Satan, held captive by him to do his will. doesn't mean that they're demon-possessed. They don't have to be demon-possessed. They're just in a kingdom with a way of thinking that is antagonistic to the things of the Lord. And so you can expect that they're going to be very, very difficult to be around. But... As we have compassion upon them, which again is not something that we have to work up. Compassion is something that we're given. It's part of the love of God uh, shed abroad in our hearts. It can be lost. We can lose compassion. But we've got it. A lot of the Christian life is just remembering who we really are, what we really have, not trying to work it up, but getting back to what God gave us. The story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the, the priest and the Levite that passed on the other side and wouldn't help the man that was robbed, they had all of the religion, they had all of the knowledge, they had all of you know that kind of a thing, and they just lost the compassion. And the Samaritan, who really, they didn't really know how to worship God, they didn't worship God in spirit and in truth, but there was a reality to his compassion. He was a neighbor to that man. And so we don't want to lose compassion for the lost because they're difficult. Of course they're difficult. You should be happy if they're not difficult. There's something wrong with them if they're not difficult because they're in the devil's kingdom. Now, I'm not sure if the cave or cave chapel would catch on as a name for our fellowship. What do you think? You could do that. You could tell people you go to cave chapel. But it's the perspective we ought to have as we gather together. The people who gathered to David believed he was the rightful king who would one day reign. They left everything for him. We know that Jesus is the rightful king who is coming to reign. Have we left everything for him? To quote Alan Redpath again, There is a king in exile who is gathering around him a company of people who are in distress, in debt, and discontent. He is training and preparing them for the day he shall come to reign. And so thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, there must be there ought to be something a little strange about us, about our decisions, about our lifestyle. People ought to be able to look at us and wonder what we're thinking or what motivates us. And the answer ought to be that we know that we might at any moment stand before the Lord to be reviewed and rewarded in preparation for reigning with him on the earth. We do these prophecy updates every week. We are in the last days. Regardless of that, the coming of Jesus for his church is imminent. Could happen at any moment. Regardless of that, you and I don't know how many breaths we have left 
All of us know someone who died suddenly at a young age or at the age that we are or younger. And so there needs to be a constant awareness, a constant appreciation that I could any moment now be face to face with Jesus. He's going to review my life. He's going to reward my life. He's going to give me a place to rule and reign in his millennial kingdom. I should be preparing for that. That's the ultimate job interview. When, when you're going for a job interview, when you're getting ready to make a change, or get, you study, you look at the requirements, you get things knocked out of the way, you're ready. And that's, that, we should be doing that. And we are, if we're sincere Christians, but we, we need to be doing it all the time. Because it's really going to happen. You're going to momentarily wake up and be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Wow. And it's exciting. It shouldn't be something that you're afraid of. I can't wait. I, I, I just can't wait. Now, as wonderful as cave life can be, we aren't meant to stay in the cave indefinitely. And so in verses 3 through 5, your church is the cave you emerge from in order to affect the kingdom. There are detrimental effects, both physical and psychological, to living underground for extended periods of time. Just so, there can be detrimental spiritual effects to extended cave living as a Christian. By, by that I mean wanting only to hang around the cave with Christians. We can become inwardly focused, ingrown. Minor matters tend to be blown way out of proportion. We, as I mentioned earlier, we can lose compassion for sinners. It's amazing. Some of you have been in churches all of your life, or uh, and you know that that some churches they just they take the smallest issue, the most something that's really insignificant in the eternal scheme of things, and they split over it, they divide over it, they fight over it. And, and uh, you look at that and you think, well, you know, right over here are people who are dying and entering eternity without Christ. And we want to we want to argue about this. We want to fight about this. We want to act as this, this as this, as if this is truly important when it's not. And so we we don't want to become ingrown or inwardly focused. We don't want to lose compassion for sinners. David and his followers didn't stay in the cave indefinitely. They utilized it as a stronghold, and then they emerged from it to affect the nation. Verse three. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Now the people gathered to David uh, and they were recognizing him as their leader, as their future king. David's first recorded priority as someone starting to act kingly was to care for his father and his mother. He made arrangements for their safety in Moab. Why Moab? David's great-grandmother was none other than Ruth the Moabitess who had married Boaz. It's a great story recounted in the book of Ruth. I pause to mention the grace of God in allowing Ruth, a Moabite woman and a Gentile, not just to be included in the uh, saved lineage of Israelites, but to be included in the line of the Messiah, the grandmother of David, from whom, er, in an earthly sense, the Messiah would come. It's a great story of the grace of God. Now, we certainly look upon David's care for his dad and mom as an indication of his tender heart. But there is something more, something really quite powerful, I think. David was starting to act kingly. His very first act as the future rightful king was to honor his father and mother. It has significance beyond his love for them. When God delivered the Jews out from slavery in Egypt, he took Moses up to Mount Sinai and gave him their new rule of life as a nation under God. We know it as the Ten Commandments. The first four of those commandments we would say are God word. They discuss responsibilities we have in a relationship with God. The second set, the last four commandments, are manward. They discuss the responsibilities of men to each other in a society. The first of those manward commandments, the fifth commandment, 
honor your father and mother. Why the first of those? Well, because in it, you get God's basic foundational understanding of human society. It is to be based upon a respect for the biblical family unit that God established in the book of Genesis. The fifth commandment clears up all confusion about what constitutes a family. Along with the seventh and tenth commandments, which mention adultery and coveting your neighbor's wife, it is God's definition of a family. A man and a woman bound in holy marriage who produce godly children. There are no other biblical alternatives. David acting to care for his father and mother, was exactly the kind of thing a king ought to do. It was the very best way to start off leading others. It was a declaration to them, a demonstration to them, that he understood what a kingdom ruled by God ought to be like. Christians have invested a lot of energy and resources defending what we call traditional marriage. We've done it out in the public arena. Certainly in our democratic society, we ought to have a voice and we ought to make it known. I have no problem with that. My question this morning to us as a church and to the church in general is how concerned are we about traditional marriage within the church? I'm not talking about being against homosexual unions. We must oppose them on the basis of the word of God. If for no other reason, the Bible says that no homosexual will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And we want people to inherit the kingdom of heaven. What I'm talking about is being for biblical marriage in which the only grounds for divorce would be desertion and adultery. How are we doing as Christians at preserving traditional marriage in the church? Well, if the statistics are any indication, we're not doing very well. Divorce is almost just as likely among believers as it is among non-believers. The church, therefore, is making its own negative contribution to human society by devaluing the institution of marriage. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin. I'm not trying to beat up on anyone who has suffered through a divorce. What I am doing is highlighting the kind of submission to Christ's authority that ought to mark us as believers. Whatever you've already been through... Start right now to submit to God's authority, especially for marriage and family. It's absolutely foundational. It's so important that uh, Paul, in writing in the New Testament to uh, to Timothy, talking about the church, which is what we're talking about, he he says one of the requirements of a leader in the church is that he rules his own home well. That his children are under control and those kinds of things. Because he goes on to say that if you can't rule your own house, how could you possibly rule the church of God? And so this, this family unit is so important. It's so foundational. And we know that, don't we? We were all for it during the last election. We need to be for it in the church. And that means in my individual life, I need to come under submission to the word of God. I need to say, Jesus, you are my king. And I'm going to live within the boundaries that you set for me because you would only give them to me if they were good. I don't see how they can be good. I don't like them right now, but this is where I'm going to camp out. And so we would say, go and sin no more. Verse 5, Now the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went back, or excuse me, went into the forest of Hereth. Gad must have been raised up as a prophet by Samuel at Naoth at the school of the prophets that he had established. God sent him to David with a directive. The encouragement of a prophet is a fitting conclusion to these five verses. God wants to encourage us to emerge from the cave following his direction that we receive there. Some of his direction we would call general. It is to be found in the precepts and principles of God's word as we read it and study it. It is to apply the wisdom of God. It is to have the mind of Christ, to think about things the way Jesus did, the way disciples should. Some of his direction needs to be more specific. We need to be seeking God for our personal lives. Where does he want us? Where is he sending us? Am I where the Lord wants me to be doing what the Lord wants me to be doing? People who like to explore caves are officially called what? Who knows? 
spelunkers. That's why I don't explore caves. I don't want to be known as a spelunker. It sounds terrible. But anyway, now, uh, now this would be cool. They are more commonly called cavers. And their activity is called caving. Now, I could get into that. Hey, where are you going? I'm going caving. Whoa. Sounds like an in thing to do. Get it? Cave in. I'm making this up. All right. For you spelunkers out there. So Christians, I was thinking about this. Christians are cavers. But in our case, the caving we do ought to explore us rather than the other way around. In other words, people who go caving, they're, they're looking to explore the cave, to see all of its beauty and inner recesses and things like that. It's an exploration of the cave. We come, and to the extent that the church is cave-like, and we meet with Jesus there, the rightful king, we're the ones being explored. As the Lord reveals our heart to us, as He shows us His heart, as His love is shed abroad in our hearts, as we understand the grace of God, the mercy of God, and those kinds of things. I, therefore, ought to be affected by, influenced by, my King in the cave. We talked, we've been talking about this in most of our messages, but every time we have the Word of God open before us, it should have an effect on our hearts, an influence on our hearts because we are being changed moment by moment from glory to glory. We're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that is a process that will go on every minute of every day until we are either uh, raptured or until our life on this earth comes to an end and the Lord takes us home to be with Him. And so we should have a a positive expectation that every time I gather with God's people around His Word, there's going to be an effect on my heart, an influence on my heart, that I should learn more about the grace of God, more about the mercy of God, more about the love of God. I should be more in love with the Lord than I ever was before. Uh, It just, you know, just to be in His presence. And then I ought to emerge from it to affect, to get results out in the kingdom of darkness while I am waiting for the kingdom of heaven to be established on the earth. Not because I have to, not even as a duty, but just as a natural kind of response to the fact that I've been with Jesus. The early disciples, one of my greatest, one of my favorite descriptions, rather, of the early disciples when when they were taken by the religious leaders, it says, these are ignorant men who have been with Jesus. That's all I want to be known as. I've got the ignorant part pretty, I've got that part down. Oh, Gene, he's an ignorant man who's been with Jesus. That's what I want to be, yeah. I mean, so that's it. And so we are ignorant men and women. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what you do. When we come together, we are ignorant men and women in the sense that we need to learn more about Jesus. And we want to. And we do. Even if the pastor doesn't nail it, even if he doesn't hit it, even if his jokes fail. That just describes 90% of my sermons, but... It's still, there's the Word of God and, and, and God begins to speak to you and He affects your heart. And there is Jesus revealed in the mirror of God's Word. And you can't help but go out looking different, feeling different, being different, having been changed from glory to glory. And what happens when you're in the presence of the Lord and there's a glory about you? Well, Moses came down from the mountain and his face glowed. People said, huh, weird. What's going on? In his case, the glory faded. Paul uses that as an example in the New Testament. He says, in our case, the glory doesn't fade. It continues to grow. I remember when I first got saved, this is weird. I mean, I, you know, I'm just hanging around doing my thing. I'm coming out of, I, I remember one of the things that I remember vividly as if it just happened. Uh, I had a, a friend I grew up with. His name was Rick Lazar. My dad used to work for his dad, Joe Lazar, when he owned a Cadillac dealership, which is something you don't need to know. But And so I'm coming out of uh, uh, St. Bernadine's Hospital. I don't know if, if uh, Mary had just been born or why I was there, but I was coming out of the hospital and I passed by Rick Lazar and uh, Rick said hi to me and then he stopped and he said, what's going on with you? You look different. You, you look a little radiant. 
No, I wasn't really, but God stopped him at that moment. I shared with him that I'd become a Christian. And he ran from me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. I mean, God could even do that. But it's not even so much, I mean, it's not, you know, the glow lamp, you know. Paint yourself with that glow. So what's, what's, what's wrong with you, you know? I glow in the dark, you know. The, been around radioactive things too long, you know, Geiger counter thing. But you go out into the world and every time we go forth, we ought to have this glowing. Now, here's, here's a thought. This is just coming to me. I hope it's not a heresy. Um, we have the impression, I understand that you go out and you get beat up and you come back in, you know, to get refreshed. But this doesn't mean that the glow or the glory that we've learned previously is gone. Because we're not like Moses. We don't just come into God's presence, get charged up, and then fade out. We're changed from glory to glory. We're being transformed, and we're not supposed to be going in the other direction. And so every time we come to the Word, the Lord is doing a transforming work in our lives, and we're taking it a step further and further. Can we divert that process? Of course, by being backslidden, keeping ourselves in a place where God wants to use us, but really doesn't and can't because our testimony is, is you know, watered down or weak. But the normal course of the Christian life, you come to the cave and when you go out, you're glowing more and more and more with the glory of God, with the grace of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God, the forgiveness of God. Would to God that would be our experience. Amen? Father, thank you for these things. We appreciate your word. It is, uh, uh, we just can't do without it, Lord. Even the smallest portion of it is precious to us. Five verses, Lord, but they're pivotal because here David began to act like a king. And the first thing he did, Lord, was a beautiful thing. And people came to him, Lord. We want to come to you. We want to establish our families. I want to pray right now for the families of the believers here in our fellowship. Marriages can struggle. There's, there's nothing like the struggle that can happen in a marriage between a man and a woman who love each other but have so much trouble getting along. And Lord, I want to pray for the marriages in our fellowship right now that Your Spirit would just infuse every marriage and especially if there's any that are in trouble. If there's any husband that does not love his life the way Christ loves the church, that we certainly would repent and do that. If there's any wife that doesn't want to submit to her husband as unto the Lord, I pray, Lord, that there would be repentance and joy in doing that. And then as parents, Lord, we're to raise our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, not provoking them to wrath or anger. Lord, I pray for the parents in our fellowship, single parent as well, that there would be an energizing by the Spirit to pay attention to those little ones, to hear what their heart is saying, to take every opportunity, like it says in Deuteronomy, in the morning when we rise, all during the day, at night when we go to bed, and to share Christ, to give them a Christian perspective and a Christian worldview, to sh uh, shape and train and mold them, to disciple them, that we would not weary in that well-doing. And then, Lord, that those husbands and wives and those children, that family unit and our families and the families of Christians in this city and in this county would absolutely shine as beacons of light to others, Lord, that they would know that there is a God and that His name is Jesus Christ, that He's risen from the dead, that He's seated in heaven, and that He's coming back again in glory. And that they would gather to us, Lord, not for our sake, but for your sake, whether it's in our neighborhood or here in the church, in the other good churches, that there would be a gathering, an in-gathering, Lord, of people who are distressed and in debt and discontent. That they would come and say, what must I do to be saved? I want to know Jesus. I've discovered that there is something in my heart that cannot be filled by anything in this world. And that we would say, that's eternity. That's eternal life, and it's only available one way in Jesus. Do that, Lord. Fall upon us by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together.